section we're working through at the moment is the section of to do control, and I introduced it to you on Monday by considering this example up here. We recall we had some discussion on various manipulated variables we might use and various control variables we might use. And today's class is all about selecting those manipulated variables to go with the corresponding control variables. As you saw, and I read my example last time, this is a, a real case study. This is a sort of type of decision-making control engineers we need to make. Not even just control engineers, uh, chemical engineers in general, when we're designing our flow sheets, have the knowledge of which manipulated variables go up with which control variables. And how we do that is going to be looked at in today's class. But let's, uh, let's start off slowly on a, on a two by two system. So two inputs, two outputs. And I introduced this study uh, in the class on Monday. We were looking at a very simple blending case study. Where we were simply taking the feed stream FA, where the concentration is XA, and then we have the solvent stream FS, which is the flow of that stream, and it has no A. When we blend those two together, we get a blend flow rate FM and we get a blended concentration XA. And from the mass balance and from all mass balance and component <coughs> we can derive that set of equations that we're looking at last time. What I said left with you on, on Monday's class is I said we're going to look at converting this to a matrix form. It's far more convenient to work with matrices when we're dealing with multiple inputs and multiple outputs. So let's take a look at how we do that. Well, we say control variable 1 and control variable 2. That's my output. In the context of this example, CV1 is the first manipulated variable would be the flow rate of M. That's going to be my, um, sorry, my first control variable is, not, yeah, it's FM. And the second control variable is XAF. So those, that concentration. I would like to control both the flow of the mixture and the concentration of the mixture. And what we're going to look at deriving here is an input vector where my inputs are my two manipulated variables. In this case, they're FA and FS. So my controlled variables are my outputs. And then I have my inputs over here. Okay, so FA would be MV1 and FS would be MV2. So you might want to add that there. MV1 is FS and MV2 is FS. So our general goal is to create a matrix where we can say our CV vector that's a vector C V is some sort of matrix and another vector here M. So I want the vector C V to lead to another vector. Uh, sorry, C V is my output vector, M V is my input vector, and then I have this transfer function matrix over here. Transfer function. And the systems we're dealing with are going to be called square systems because our number of manipulated variables is going to be the same as the number of controlled variables. And so that matrix then is a square matrix. So you will hear this terminology in post control if you use the square system, that's because your inputs and output number are the same. So what is the transfer function that goes here in this first position? Take a look at those equations that you have in front of you. We're using the linearized model. Here's my outputs and my inputs. What is the first transfer function in the 1, 1 position? Anyone? No, sorry. I guess. No guesses even? Okay, yes, it's one. What is the transfer function in the first row, second column? Okay, 
It's also one, okay? So Fm is equal to Fa plus Fs. Okay, so the coefficients in front of that is a one and a one. Let's take a look at the second row. The second output is Xam. The first transfer function in the second row tells me what happens to Xam when I vary Fa. So the transfer function over there is this term fs divided by fs plus fa squared. So xam is equal to this term fs divided by fs plus fa squared multiplied by fa. And then the second term is negative fa divided by fs squared. <clears throat> so I've represented that, that set of equations there, the linearized model for the system, I've just represented it now in matrix form. Right? A vector of control variables on the output, two control variables in this case are fm and xam, and then I've got my vector of inputs, and I fill in the transfer function matrix. Everyone clear on, on how that matrix is arrived? So it's a short little warm up here for this morning. People are still kind of asleep. So let's um, let's take a look at the way we use this. Well, remember last time we had, we were looking at these diagrams that relate the inputs to the outputs, and we were using these diagrams to figure out if there's interaction in the system. Let's draw the diagram for this case. My two inputs are F A. And my second input is fs. And we derive transfer functions that tell me what happens to the output for the inputs. So my two outputs in this case, as I said, are fm. And my second output is xam. So let's, uh, let's fill in these transfer functions. We said that this input FA will have some interaction on XAM, which we represented that intermediate transfer function. And the second input FS also has some interaction on the first output. So we drew these diagrams in class last time. What four entries go in those corresponding boxes? What goes in the first box? What's the transfer function that relates the input FA to the output FM? One. One, okay. So the G11, transfer function here is 1. G11, remember this terminology, Gij, the i refers to the output, and the j refers to the input. Okay, so the transfer function in the 1-1 position is 1. What is the transfer function that relates the input fa to the output xam? fs over fs plus a squared. Okay, fs over fs plus fa squared. Which, what's the number of this transfer function in here? G12 or G21? G21. G21, okay. So G21 is this transfer function over here. The next transfer function down is G, which one? G12. And that's equal to 1. Okay, so this is the transfer function that tells you what happens if you change Fs and the effect on Fm. So as we add more solvents to the system, the flow rate of the mixture goes up. It's a positive transfer function. And then Fs related to Xam is G22. That's my last transfer function.
Quick question, does the sine of G22 make sense? G22 is a negative. We know that because FA, FS, and FA are all positive quantities, so there's a negative sign there. Does it make sense that G22 is negative? Quick check, Our consistency here. Yeah? Okay, everyone agrees. Okay, so let's, um, let's take a look now at another way that we can derive these transfer function matrices. We've derived these four entries based on our first principles knowledge, but sometimes our systems are so complex we cannot resort to that sort of um, derivation. So what we'll do is we have to do step tests. So let's take a look here at this distillation column. Here's an example of two inputs and two outputs. So my outputs in this example are the distillate concentration and the bottom slide key concentration. So XD and XB. Those are my two outputs. And I'm able to manipulate so my input variables, my inputs or my MVs. I have two valves that I can use to change those two outputs. XD and XB can be adjusted by varying my reflux flow rate R and by varying my boil up vapor that I send back up into the column with the reboiler. So V is my second manipulated variable. So I can either send more liquid back into the column, so increase R, or I can send more or less vapor back up in the bottom instead from the reboiler. So if I open that steam valve, I create more vapor and, and send, send that up in the bottom. So those are my two manipulated variables and my two control variables. And the relationship between them is non-obvious. Right? We don't know what the theoretical derivation is. There's many trays. Yeah. So for example, if I increase the vapor flow V, that goes up through the trays, through the condenser, and I'll eventually observe a change in XD. And so by increasing V, I'm going to affect both XD and XB, those light key concentrations in the distillate <coughs> and the volume. And so because that relationship is too complex to figure out from theoretical equations, I simply make step changes in my plant. So here we observe we make a change in R to so step R up and keep V constant. So here we see a step up in R and V is, remains the same. And then I observe XD changing in this first order plus time delay way, and I observe XB changing in a first order plus time delay way. And I can then use the process reaction curve method we derived earlier to figure out what these four transfer functions are. So the G11, the G21, the G12, and G22 can be calculated through that method. Yes. Wait, didn't you say yesterday that when you're tuning, you have to do the step input simultaneously for both variables? We're not tuning yet. We're, um, what we're doing is we're trying to figure out what these transfer functions are. So we don't know what G11, G21, G21, and G22 are yet. When it's absolutely right. When we tune, we have to tune both loops simultaneously. But we're not even at that point yet. We're still figuring out what our process looks like. So we get that. And then we would switch this around. Now the graphs are not shown here. The next step is you keep R constant and step V. And then you would get another two curves for SD and XB. So you get your four transfer functions that way. Okay, so we can do it either theoretically, derived it from first principles equations. So one way is fundamental modeling. And the second way you can figure out what those transfer functions are, are through the step test of the process reaction curve. Either way, you land up with the transfer function matrix now. Okay, and here, for example, might be the transfer functions for the distillation column. So we see our gains, our time delays, and time constants four, four times, relating each of the two inputs to the two outputs. 
Now, what we're going to start to see in today's class is we're going to be less concerned about these time constants and time delays. The only thing we're really going to care about is the gain. Okay? The gain is really what makes a critical distinction in the process. Remember back when we were shooting single loop controllers? The most important thing about the feedback controller is that the sign of the feedback controller must match the sign of the process. Okay? We have that same idea here in multi-loop control. So what we're going to end up doing here is we're not going to concern ourselves with the time constants, nor the time delays. We're going to drop those away. And the reason is quite simple. The time constants simply tell you how long it takes to reach steady state, and the time delay tells you how long the delay is before you reach steady state. But given enough time, you will reach steady state, and the thing that tells you where you're going to land up is the gain. So the time constant and the time delay don't mean too much. They simply tell you how long it's going to take to get to steady state, but the gain is really the important parameter that tells you what that steady state is. Okay, so what we'll end up doing is we're going to create a steady state gain matrix from <coughs> the system. So for the distillation column, our steady state gain matrix is going to have which four entries? What will be the first entry? Zero point zero seven. Right. 0.07. The next one. What's the steady state gain element in the first row, second column? Minus 0 0.06. And down here we have 0 0.1 and then minus 0 0.1. Okay, so this steady state gain matrix simply tells me the relationships of the gains between the inputs and the outputs. We dropped, what we've done is we've dropped away the dynamics. The time constants and the time delay, no dynamic issues. We drop away and we simply consider, given enough time, that's what the system's behavior is going to be. And so we're going to start to see that coming up in the next section. And the re other reason why we use it is if we land up with a system where our gains are all on the diagonal and we have zeros everywhere else, then we know we have a set of independent inputs and outputs. You can then go manipulate variable one and control variable one, you know, be tuned and worked on totally independently because none of the other inputs are affecting it and none of the other outputs will be affected by that. Okay. So having zeros on the off diagonals is a great result. It means we have independence in our system. And then we can go use all the stuff we learned earlier in the course. What today's class is about is when you don't have zeros over there. Okay? That's what we're going to try and figure out. And then to come back uh, to the point is where, how are we going to tune the system if we have non-zeros there. So for example, in this case study, we, do, we have non-zero here, non-zero here. These two transfer functions are non-zero indicating that if I make a change in this input fs, it's going to propagate up through and affect the other outputs. So how do we deal with that? One final example before we move on. Yes, Mark. So all independent Yes, we are. Not diagonal and all of the rooms are independent. Yeah. If they all zero <coughs> on the old diagonals, you have independent rooms. Let's take a look at uh, one more example before we move on. Uh, this example looks at a tank that's heated, uh, that's cooled this time. We're cooling with valve V2, and we're feeding with valve V1. Now, those are my two manipulated variables. My two controlled variables are the temperature in the tank and the concentration of A. So two controlled variables, two manipulated variables. There is a third manipulated variable and control variable, but that's already taken care of. The level in the tank, that control variable is adjusted by this outlet valve position. But we're going to assume that loop is separate and operating independently. And we're going to just look at the two by two case where temperature and, and concentration of A 
are affected by the valve position of cooling and the valve inlet flow. Now, one thing here, A is the concentration, that A is measuring the concentration of your reactant. So it's a bit uh, redundant here, but be careful with duplication. A is also your species. So this analyzer A is measuring the concentration of A, your, your B. It's an exothermic reaction, and there's a temperature dependence on the kinetics. So what's going to happen if I increase the valve position for V1? What's going to happen to my two others? Okay, so let's, um, let's draw one of these interacting diagrams again. We've got two inputs, two outputs. We're trying to figure out the dynamics and, sorry, the, the gains in the system. So V1 is my input, V2 is my second input. Let's uh, call A my first output, and let's call T my second output. But the first thing we want to figure out, is there interaction in the system? And the second thing we want to figure out is, what is the sign in the gain matrix going to be? Positives or negatives? So, this G11 transfer function represents the effect between V1 and A. What is the sign in that transfer function? If you open V1, what's going to happen to A? Talk about it. What's the next one? Nothing happens to A. Who votes for decreasing? One or two people. Okay. So let's work through this. You increase this flow, you've got more A coming into the into the reactor at a faster rate. So you've got higher flow. The outlet flow is constant. At least initially it's constant. So for short term, you've got an increase in flow in the tank. Longer or shorter residence time. Shorter residence time, less chance for the material to react. Reduction in conversion. So A goes up. Okay. So we expect to see some sort of rise up here in A. So the gain in this entry there, E11, is a positive number. What is the effect <coughs> of raising V1 on temperature? No effect. A positive increase or a decrease in temperature? Plus, minus, zero. Zero. Anyone vote for zero? Vote for plus. Vote for a decrease in temperature. Okay, so we've increased that flow rate into the tank. There's a shorter residence time, less time to contact the coils, but also shorter residence time, less reaction, less heat of reaction released. Okay, so lower kinetics, lower conversion, less heat of reaction released, less heat being um, released by the reaction, also less contacting time with the coils. So for all those reasons, the decrease. So G21 is going to be a negative. So reduction in temperature. Let's take a look at the effect of valve V2. If we increase our cooling to the tank, so again, let's consider a step increase in V2. 
keeping V1 constant, so I'm not changing V1 this time, just change V2. What's going to happen to, to this uh, second, sorry, the G22 transfer function? Negative, right? So add more cooling to the tank, increase the cooling flow, a reduction in temperature. What's going to happen to the concentration? G12. No effect, increase, decrease, up, down, yeah. I'm sure. Okay, you add more cooling to the tank, you reduce the temperature in the vessel, lower kinetics, your reaction rate drops, lower kinetics, less conversion rate, so A should increase the flow. So we should observe that this A will rise. Okay. So positive sign. Okay, if you do those step tests, you'll not only get the sign, but you'll also get the magnitude of the gain. Okay, right now we, we can't do that just from a discussion like this. So we we can calculate a gain matrix fairly easily using our step tests on our process. Okay, and then we've set up this sort of diagram. The last thing that we can add to this diagram is the effect of disturbances. I haven't added those yet, uh, but you can certainly draw them in as shown over here. What might be some of the disturbances on this process? So for example, what would be a disturbance that will affect A or T? Temperature of the cooling water, so temperature of the cooling water changes, will it affect A? Yes. Will it affect T? Yeah. So both GD1 and GD2 will be non-zero. We can calculate these disturbance transfer functions for a change in cooling water temperature. What's another disturbance that could come in here? Composition of the feed, so CA0 was assumed constant. So CA0 will affect T or A, or both. Okay, so if CA0 increases, we'll get an increase in A and a change in T. Okay. So various disturbances are possible, and we can calculate transfer functions for each of those disturbances as well. Okay, let's take a look now back at one of the first problems I asked about at the start of this section, and that is, should you use valve V1 to control A, or should you use valve V1 to control T? And then secondly, should you use valve V2 to control T, or should you use valve V2 to control A? Which, this is the pairing problem. Which manipulated variable do we pair with which control variable? Firstly, let's ask this question. Can I use valve V1 to manipulate temperature? Yeah, we've just established that if I change V1 through the G21 position, I will affect T. Okay, so there's a cause and effect relationship between V1 and T. There's a cause and effect relationship between V1 and A. That's given in this transfer function. The fact that all four of these transfer functions are non-zero indicates that there's a cause and effect relationship between all the manipulated variables and both control variables. Back to this question. Should V1 be used for A or T? And V2 should be used for T or A? T. Why? Shouldn't it just depend on the size of the game? Shouldn't it depend on the size of the game? 
So higher gain to carry them up. More direct, feels more direct. Feels like there's less interaction maybe. Okay, we're going to derive a systematic method that tells us. The ideal case is we would like whatever pairing we choose, so let's say as suggested to pair V1 with A, we would like V1 when paired with A to behave as close to the case when V1 and A were an independent system of V2 and T. The, the thinking is, I would like whatever pairing I choose that those pairs of manipulated and controlled variables that when they're operating independently they're going to behave the same as when they're operating interactively. Okay? This is the thinking we're going to have in mind. So let's take a look at how we might consider that. And what we use for that is a tool called the Relative Gain Array. So there's another short handout on this, um, this topic. So it's a single page coming around. Just pass those back. simply the first entry from your gain matrix. If we take this element over there, we'll call that CV2 divided by MV1. So that entry over there just comes from the second position. So the I's refers to the outputs and the J's refers to the inputs. So the numerator term is very easy to find. It's simply the gain from the steady state gain matrix. 
may want to make a note of that. So the numerators are the gains from the steady state gain matrix. Every entry, so CBI divided by MVJ. So it's just take for output I over input J. Oh, it's just uh, just the gain numerator. Yeah, all other loops are. The denominator is the messy part. Okay. The denominator requires you to go do a different test. It says go repeat that same test between the i-th output and the j-th input, but all the other loops are closed with feedback control with an integral mode. So it says, let's say we're considering the 1-1, one, one, CB1 with MB1. It says, what is this element here, G11, one, one, going to be if all the other loops are closed? In other words, that would require me to go put a feedback controller on this second loop. Put that feedback controller in, make sure there's integral mode on there. So all my other loops are closed, but what is going to happen to G11 if I make a step change here and I observe that output over there? All other loops are closed. So it's a, it's a bit of a strange conceptual idea, but let's think about this. What happens if the numerator term and the denominator term are the same. Let's say you get a 4, a value of 4 in the numerator, and you get a value of 4 in the denominator. Is that independent? Yeah, an independent loop. It's an independent loop. So if you get the same value in the numerator and the same value in the denominator, it's telling you that this transfer function doesn't change its behavior when there's other feedback control loops around it. It's not interacting with any of the other loops. So a value of 1 is ideal. Okay? So all other loops closed. Remember we said that we showed on Monday's class, I showed you that very complex sort of snaking red dot red line that I drew on the board that shows you how the systems interact when there's when there's closed loop. So when there's a closed loop, CV1 over MV1 will behave differently than when all the other loops are open. But should you get the same value with open loops and closed loops, it's telling you that that loop is totally independent of the other closed loops. And that's a good result to have. We like values close to one. Okay, so yes, Mark. Um, so then for your other, so for the next one over, like um, for G2, um, one would be, yeah. would they both be zero? Like for the one the line? Okay, so we go do this experiment for every single IJ combination. Yeah. Okay, so we go and let's say we go now and consider CV2 with MV1. We've already got that value. Now we go and measure CV2's effect when I change MV1, keeping all the other loops closed. So you, if you've got a 3 by 3 system, you have to go do this experiment 9 times. So it won't automatically be zero for the rest of your bundle? Oh, because if there's interaction with the system, that's going to be non-zero. Right? So that's what we showed on Monday's classes. And there's interaction in these loops. Any change you make over here has an effect on that output light up there. Okay. Choice. So when you do the experiments, you have to stop the We're going to see you don't actually have to do all the experiments. <laughs> Okay. This is just from a conceptual point of view. Now, some has done a whole lot of theoretical work and showed that we don't have to do any of these denominator experiments. In fact, there's a nice result that shows you only have to do the numerator experiments. All these experiments we just discussed now, which are very easy to do, those are the only ones you have to do. The way it works is, if you want to calculate those values, let's call them lambda ij. 
So lambda ij is this ratio between the numerator and the denominator. We can go create a new matrix of lambda. So the terminology is we can go create a, a matrix of lambda 1, 1, lambda 1, 2, lambda 1, 3. Okay. Those would be the first three rows in the matrix for CD1, and then you change MD1 to M3. So let's put this like this, MD1, MD2, MD3. Okay, so lambda 1, 1 represents the effect of MD1 and CD1. Lambda 1, 2 represents the effect of MD2 onto CD1. So you can go and calculate these nine, nine lambda values. But there's a shortcut. This matrix here called lambda, we'll call this simply capital lambda, the Greek letter, looks like that. So that matrix of nine lambda entries, we can go calculate that matrix in one go by simply using the steady state gain matrix. What is the steady state gain matrix? The steady state gain matrix is just this matrix over here. K represents this matrix of gains when you measure what happens when you change MV1 on CV1, MV1 on CV2, 3, all the combinations. So that K there represents the matrix of gains between each of the I and J inputs and outputs. Okay, and then we have this nice result that lambda is equal to K. This dot with this, uh, a circle with the multiplication around it means element by element multiplication. That's the equivalent to MATLAB of dot multiply. Okay? Times K inverse transposed. <coughs> so what if someone has done and done all the work for us is let's consider a two by two system. So K11, K12. K21 and K22. So you've got those four gains between the two inputs and two outputs. If you calculate lambda, lambda 1, 1 in the first position is simply equal to this. So there's a shortcut result. So you don't have to calculate K inverse transpose multiplied by K. So that's the shortcut result there for the first entry, lambda 1, 1. There's a nice rule that we get from all of this. I'll just uh, I'll go to this. Uh, we'll skip two for now. This this rule here is really useful. Each row in the matrix lambda will sum to one, and each column will sum to one. That's a really convenient rule because if you calculated one of the entries in the column then you can calculate some of the others quite quickly. Let's take a look at a two by two system. So if you look at a two by two system, if you've calculated lambda one one, you've done all the work. Okay? Because you can then calculate lambda two one, lambda one two, and lambda two two by using this rule that all the rows must sum to one and all the columns must sum to one. Okay, but time for an example. Let's take a look at the most simplest example. And that's with a system that actually really is independent. Second control variable have a gain matrix of 
5002. Now let's interpret what that is before we go ahead and do the calculations. Does manipulated variable 1 affect control variable 2? Does MV1 affect CV2? No. Does MV2 affect CV1? No. So we know that this is already an independent system. MV1 and paired with CV1 will be independent of MV2 paired with CV2. Okay? So we, we can already see from this result, I can pair MV2 and CV2, and I can pair MV1 with CV1, and those two control loops will never interact. But let's prove it to ourselves. Calculate what your lambda matrix looks like. Lambda matrix is equal to K times the element by element product of K inverse transpose. Calculate it using this formula. Don't use the shortcut formula. Use the actual full multiplication. What's the inverse of K? exactly the result we expect. We get that this ratio lambda, so here this is telling me that lambda 1, 1 is equal to 1. Lambda 1, 1 equal to 1 tells me that when I control CV1 with MV1, in open loop I get the same gain than if the other loops are closed. So CV1 over MV1 We'll have the same gain, a gain of 5, whether the other loop is open or closed. It doesn't matter. It's telling me that if I open this loop, if I break that loop, or that loop is closed, it's not going to affect the gain between NV1 and CV1. And that's absolutely sensible because there's no interaction between the second loop and the first loop. So we get a value of lambda ij or 1, 1 here of lambda is equal to 1. So there's a, there's a great result. Now let's take a look at this as a quick wrap up for yourself. What happens if you had arbitrarily chosen these elements in a different order? So in other words, you put 0, 5, 2, 0 there. Has the system changed? No, it hasn't. I've just called what I used to call MV1, I've now called MV2. What I used to call MV2, I've called MV1. So prove to yourself at home, and we'll start with this on Friday's class, prove to yourself that you still get the same lambda. 
and the same interpretation. Okay, so the order in which you number your loops makes no difference.